We're going to go straight to the word this morning, and uh, the title of my message this morning is Let's Be Friends. Let's be friends. Look at the person next to you and say, let's be friends. Uh, hopefully, if you're married, you're talking to your husband or your wife right now and not to somebody else. And uh, we're going to talk about friendship. How you know Valentine's Day uh, can bring with it a, a certain level of pressure, especially the way it's been commercialized. And, and Mandy and I couldn't help noticing that this year, it seems like they, it hasn't been made such a big deal of as it sometimes is. And uh, in a way, I think that's a good thing because uh, we come under pressure to perform and to come up with something new and to spend lots of money. And how you know... After today, very often, everything just goes back to the way it was anyway. Now, if that was good, fantastic. <laughs> but I mean, if it wasn't so great, then tomorrow you've got to get up and you've got to live your life again. Also, f- f- uh, on Valentine's Day, sometimes for, for many people, it's a painful reminder of the reality that they don't have good relationships. Or it's a reminder uh, of a love or of a relationship that's brought hurt into their lives. And so as a church, we need to be sensitive to where people are and what people are going through. But you know, this morning, if we refocus our attention to Christ, we are made incredibly aware of the greatest love story ever told. Amen? And I want you to know that love story is between God and mankind. It's between Christ and the church. And in a very real way this morning, it's between you and Jesus. Would you just close your eyes for a moment this morning and just focus in on the wonderful grace of Jesus Christ and realize this morning that God loves you. God is not mad at you. He's mad about you. Can you say amen? And so I want you to know this morning that we're going to talk about friendship this morning. And uh, what we want to cover, we're going to look at it maybe from a slightly different point of view. Experts tell us that if you end up with three to five really close friends over the course of your life, you are really blessed. They also tell us that if one of those happens to be your marriage partner, one of your children, or a family member, then you're extremely blessed. And so we want to talk about this morning, not so much what it means to have a good friend. I want to talk to you about being a good friend. Because I believe as the church, as as an individual, you should be a good friend. Can you say amen? And we're going to make it really simple this morning. I'm going to give you uh, three headings. And under three headings, there's going to be three little sub points. So uh, all in all, there are nine points. And uh, that'll hopefully help us to remember uh, Some important things I think this morning that God will teach us and inspire us when it comes to being a good friend. John 15 verse 11, if you'll open your Bibles there this morning, and we're going to use that as our text. I would encourage you to go read the book of John chapter 15, chapter 16, and chapter 17. In chapter 17, Jesus prays the most powerful, awesome prayer ever recorded in the Bible, ever recorded anywhere, and you can read it in John 17. He actually speaks about you in John 17, believe it or not, and you can go read it. And the build-up starts here in John 15. We're going to pick it up in verse 11 this morning. It says, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you. Please underline that in your Bibles or make a note. I've spoken these things to you that my joy, say joy. Okay, say it with a smile on your face. Say joy. Joy is good. That my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Please remember that sentence. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have from my Father, I have made known 
to you. Jesus says something very powerful, and if you'll go and meditate on this, uh, these passages or these few verses this week, I really believe God will reveal some amazing things into your life. But let's make a few observations. Number one, when you receive the love of God, attached to the love of God is the joy of God. And so he's telling us then when, when, when you have friendship in your life, it's a source of love and it's a source of joy. He goes on and he says, listen, I want you to know that I want to call you my friend this morning. I want to call you my friend. And then he says, now that you've received this joy, this love, and this friendship that I've extended to you, the way you display your friendship with God is to do what he tells you to do. Bump the person next to you and say obedience. Now listen carefully. Obedience isn't a work you do. It's a response you give to the person that loves you. Amen. That changes everything. That is new covenant teaching. That is grace teaching. It's not a work you do to earn something. It's a response of something God's already done in you. That's what makes it fruit. And that's what makes it powerful. Now, I want to talk to you in these three areas this morning. I want to make three suggestions about friendship. I want to talk to you about the characteristics of friendship. And then we're going to look at the benefits of friendship. So first, let me make three suggestions this morning related to you becoming a good friend. Number one, make Jesus your best friend today. Make Jesus your best friend today. Now, uh, your scripture here is John 13. John 15 kind of covers all these points this morning, but I want to give you a little bit more scripture that you can think about and reflect on. In John 13, verse 1, it says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, listen to this, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Think about this. How many friends do you know that will love you to the end? How many friends do you know that will actually lay down their lives for you? So I want you to know right on the onset from these first two scriptures, it's very apparent this morning, Jesus wants to be your friend. Jesus has already called you his friend. And your response this morning should be one of, Jesus, I want you to be my best friend. Now, I know growing up, if you had an invisible friend, then you would get mocked. How, how many of you had an invisible friend? You don't have to put your hands up. But I want you to know, once you're born again, once you're washed in the blood of Jesus, it's actually okay to have an invisible friend. <laughs> Isn't it crazy how the world is? And I want you to know in a real, practical, honest way this morning, Jesus is the best friend you'll ever have. Amen. How many of you remember that old song? What a friend we have in Jesus, all our pain and... <laughs> what a privilege to carry everything to him in prayer oh what often forfeit come on work with me oh what needless pain we bear all because we do not carry everything to christ in prayer You didn't start my backing track. <laughs> what a friend we have in Jesus. And I want you to know that if you'll allow Christ to be your friend, it will revolutionize your life in such an incredible way because he is truly a good friend. I'm talking about someone this morning that knows everything about you. The good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> very sharp and he still loves you anyway can you say amen, amen. and you see when, when we open our hearts and we allow Christ to become big in us and we we focus our lives on Jesus and his finished work you see I can be holy today because he is holy I'm righteous today because he is righteous 
I'm confident today because he's confident. And so Jesus really does make the difference. He is always the one who's there for you. He's always there to pick you up. So uh, my first point this morning, that God wants you built up, he wants you settled, and he wants you strong in God's love and grace. Number two, number one, make Jesus your best friend. Number two, decide to follow his example. So just as he is your best friend, make a decision this morning that you are going to be a good friend. 1 John 1 verse 7 says this, but if we really, I'm reading out of the Amplified uh, Translation, it says, but if we really are living and walking in the light as he himself is in the light, we have true unbroken fellowship, listen, with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses, removes us from all sin and guilt, keeps us cleansed from sin in all its forms and manifestations. This is such a powerful truth this morning. It says this, that if we have fellowship with Christ, and if we allow Christ to live in us, we can have true fellowship with one another. That gives me a couple of secrets here, and I don't want to get ahead of myself, but you've got to realize this morning, you follow Christ's example by becoming your own best friend. You know why many people can't be friends of other people? Because they don't like themselves. Just smile, look forward. No one knows I'm talking about you this morning. But I want to encourage you this morning. You've got to learn to love and accept yourself, not because you're perfect, but because you're imperfect. You learn to love and accept yourself because Jesus has already actually paid the price for your sin. He's made you right with God and he's accepted you into the beloved. Thanks, Brother Dion. So because of that love that has been placed in you, because Christ accepted you, you can accept yourself. You can actually become your best friend. You never have to say again, I'm lonely because you can keep yourself company. It's actually okay for you to be on your own at times because you are good company. Can you say amen? amen? And I want you to know this is really, really important because learning to accept yourself, learning to follow Christ's example by becoming your own best friend, I want you to know what happens is this, it makes you a better person. Because you see, hurting people hurt people. When you've got issues and things going on in your own life and you're not dealing with your life from a place of truth and a place of freedom, you're going to complicate all your other relationships, especially, especially your close ones. And this is a way that you can walk in liberty and free. So, freedom. So I'm talking about partaking of his love, of his joy, and of his peace in your life. You know, there's something powerful about the peace of God. When you have the peace of God in you, it really honestly doesn't matter too much about what's going on around you because you're centered in the solid peace of God in your life. And I want to encourage you this morning, right now there's a temptation in this country and probably around the world as well to become discouraged, to get our eyes off Christ and onto people, onto things, onto, onto some of the bad things that are happening in our nation and around the world. But here's the truth, church, we are the hope. And you can't be the hope if you're not living in the hope of Christ. Can you say amen? Look at the person next to you, say, you're going over, not under. Those very words came back to haunt me this uh, last week when I played some golf because I was behind a tree after my drive and the only way to get out was to go under the tree. And the guy playing with me said, you know, you don't even follow your own preaching. I said, what are you talking about? He said, you're supposed to go over, not under. <laughs> Philippians 1 verses 3 to 6. Let's have a look at this this morning. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always and in every prayer of mine, making request for you with all joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing. He who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ. Uh, this scripture speaks about, in, in, in the one translation, it says, I, I think of you every opportunity because of your fellowship in the gospel. 
And that word fellowship there is the word partnership. It's the word communion and interaction. So this verse again encourages us firstly about the importance of having fellowship with Jesus, having fellowship with the gospel, which is reading the word and studying the word. You know, when when you read the Bible, you're having fellowship with God. You know what we're doing right now, which is something so powerful, is in the, in the corporate anointing of the Holy Spirit, as, as we're fellowshipping together, we're fellowshipping around the Word, and there's something powerful that's happening in your spirit right now. There's something powerful that's happening in your mind right now, because the Word of God is renewing your mind. It's strengthening you. Can you feel the Holy Spirit just, just speaking into your heart, just energizing you right now? Can you say amen? Any minute, some of you are going to break out in a smile for the first time this week and you're going to actually crack a smile you won't you won't do your face any damage you'll actually be okay come on look at the person next to you give them a big smile show them you brushed your teeth this morning come on now you see friendship does something positive in our soul friendship does something powerful in our soul when we know that we have a friend that has got our back, when we have a friend that we can talk to, and more than that, when we know that we are a friend to someone else that does something. You see, I don't want to mess up in my life because I know there are people that I'm friends with that will get affected by what I do. So in a sense, knowing that I'm a good friend to someone makes me and keeps me accountable to to live my life in a way that will honor God. Are you getting some help this morning? Okay, number three, under three suggestions I want to make to you this morning. The third one is this, be a friend to sinners. Be a friend to sinners. I know some of you are like, huh? Where did you get this one from, pastor? You're telling us to be friends with sinners. Yep. Number one, make Jesus your best friend. Number two, follow his example. Number three, be the friend to sinners. Let me take you to a very interesting verse in Matthew 11, verse 18 and 19. Jesus is speaking. How many of Jesus carries a little bit of authority this morning? Anyone, anyone agree with me on that one? Okay, this is what he says. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The son of man comes eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and a wine bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners... But wisdom is justified by her children. Jesus is saying this, is the reason I came to this earth was for sinners and those who are lost and those who need salvation. If you're saved, you don't need salvation this morning. Can you say amen? Do you have anyone in the church you're saved this morning? Can I have a good holy way from you? If you don't put up your hand, you will put it up later when we do the altar call. So now you have a choice to make. But I want you to know this morning, Jesus was the friend to sinners. Now, interesting enough, this word friend is not the same word friend in the new covenant that we just read. That word friend speaks about fellowship and interaction and communion. This one speaks about just being friendly. And there's a difference this morning, and I want to clarify that for you, especially for the younger generation this morning who may be... Uh, are drawn to negative peer groups and and get involved with wrong things. That's not what we're talking about here. We should not be friendly with the world, but we should be friendly with those who are in the world. Because how else can the gospel go to work if we're not sharing it and spending time with the people who need to hear the gospel? How do you think the church grows? How do you think we make a difference in people? If we never befriend them, we can never build a relationship where they can see Jesus in us. Now, the number one way, you can go through all the different means, and and, and we study this regularly, and we have a look at it, uh, you know, on a regular basis, but the number one way that people get saved this morning, the number one way, it's not through TV preaching, it's not through evangelistic crusades, it's not through going to stand on street evangelism, and there's nothing wrong with any of those mediums. They're good, they're necessary, they're great. The number one way people get saved is through relationships. 
when people see your life as different, when people experience the difference that Christ has made in your life and they see it living out in front of them, they are attracted to the spirit of Christ that is in you and they see there's something different about you and it draws them to Christ. Can you say amen? Amen. If we had more time, we'd do the illustration. Yeah, if I asked who got saved at a 10 crusade, who got saved through TV ministry, and then who got saved because someone brought them to church and built a relationship, I guarantee it would be 70% of us. So, so being a friend of a sinner is a very powerful thing. I'll tell you what else being a friend of a sinner does this morning. It makes you more thankful for your walk with God. There's a joy that comes when you tell other people about Christ and you bring them to church and they get saved. Can you say amen? There's something powerful that happens when you go on an outreach and you go minister the gospel to others and, and you're brought to the reality of what it means to be saved. Have, have you been out in the world today and see what people live, what people put up with, and the stuff they do to try and exist? It makes you so grateful for the salvation that Christ brought into your life. Can you say amen? So I want to encourage you, get involved with the outreach ministry and uh, you can see uh, Eric and Mandy will let you know. Get involved in a mission trip. Get involved in the church. Serve and make a difference and be a friend to sinners. Now, I'm going to contradict, contradict myself just for a minute. You should know you must be the friend of sinners, but not really. <laughs> can I clarify just quickly? You've got to learn to understand the power of boundaries in your life. You've got to understand the power of boundaries. So if you are a recovered alcoholic, I wouldn't recommend that you go and be friends with those who hang out at bars. Can you understand? You've got to understand the power of boundaries in your life, and you've got to understand where you are in relation to where God wants you to be. Let me give you a scripture to try and explain this power of boundaries. How many know boundaries are very important? Boundaries speak about a fence that you put, you know, how many know if you have a house, then you put a fence around that house, and that defines where your property is, where your boundary is. Boundaries are important in our life today, and especially when it comes to being friends with sinners or with those who are not serving Christ, because the Bible also says, have no fellowship with darkness. And it uses the different word to the one of being friendly, and we need to distinguish that, especially if we're young today and we haven't had experience. Let me read a scripture that for years I've preached incorrectly. (laughs) Proverbs 18 verse 24, it says, a man who has friends must himself be friendly. But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. I always thought this scripture was a great scripture to use. If you want to have friends, you need to be friendly. But if you go study it in the original, it actually doesn't say that. This is what it says. The Amplified brings it out, but you can see it in the the Hebrew clearly. It says this, a man of many friends, in brackets, a friend of the world, will prove himself a bad friend. But there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. This scripture offers perspective on the type of friends that you should allow into your life to influence you and impact your purpose and your values. So listen carefully. Jesus was always friendly with everybody, but he didn't allow everybody to be his friend. And there's a big difference this morning. So I want to encourage you today. Yes, we've got to be friendly with sinners. Yes, we've got to try and impact and influence and be a blessing and go out there and make a difference in a lost and dying world. But you don't let all those people influence your spirit, influence your walk with God, drag you down to a place where you start doing what they were doing instead of you influencing them to come to church and start living the way you're living. Can you say amen? Did you get that this morning? All right, praise the Lord. Let's go to the second one this morning. Those were my three suggestions. Here are my three characteristics of friendship. Friendship is a wonderful gift. It's a beautiful gift. And God's word offers advice on the person that we should be if we want to attract the right people into our lives. You see, friendship is like a magnet and it will draw people into your life. And if you're the right person, if you're a whole person and you understand the characteristics of friendship, you'll attract the right people into your life. So here are, here are three characteristics of friendship. Number one, friendship must be true and genuine. 
Proverbs 17, 17 says this, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. I don't know, uh, those of you who've lived a little bit longer, uh, I'm not saying you're old, but those who've lived a little bit longer might remember Billy Joel's song of 1978, the song Honesty. Uh, And the one line in the chorus says, honesty is such a lonely word, and it's so true today. Honesty really is a lonely word, and I want you to know our friendship needs to be based on truth. We need to always remember that Christ should be the center of our relationships and our friendships. You see, I know a lot of friendships, and I've I've had some of those friendships in my life. They're purely based on fleshly um, substance or material things. And, And the danger of those friendships is when the benefits cease, so does the friendship. How many of you had some of those friendships before? Amen? Uh, you, you see those who have got a little bit of extra cash, especially when they're younger. How many of they attract all these friends? But the day comes when they get into trouble. Where are all those friends? Gone with the wind. See, I'm quoting all the movies this morning. <laughs> so I want you to know that you need to base your relationships on truth, base them and keep them as, with Christ as the center And realize this morning, not everyone is going to be able to be your close friend. I believe this, you know, you can have three to five friends. It's not just because that's a negative statement, because the reality is how can you have more? Because friendship takes time. Friendship takes effort to develop. And so you see, even for like, for myself and Mandy as pastors in the church, it's very difficult because we'd like to be friends with everybody. We'd like to have a bride with all of you and go out and hang out because we love you. You're our family, you're, you're our partners, and we, we love what, what God is doing in your life and in our life. But how you know, on a practical level, you know, if, if we've got 600 people in our church, you know, it'll take us two years if we visit someone every single night just to visit you once. And how many of you know, in that time, you're not going to make an impact on people? So that's why we've got to develop friendships within the local church and within the network of Christianity and build and develop those relationships and be mature about and healthy about how those relationships go. In other words, I've got some friends in Joburg who are no longer my close friends simply because I don't live there anymore. And it would be impossible to maintain a close friendship. Do I still like them? Yes. Do I still love them? Do I occasionally speak to them? Absolutely. But to have them as a close friend would just not be practical anymore. Because I've got a vision to live down here and I've got something to fulfill. So that doesn't make it negative. It just means our lives move on. And so we don't have to be uh, hurt and we don't have to take it personally. But we can develop and grow. Are you getting some help this morning? Number two. We're talking about the characteristics of friendship. Number two, uh, friendship needs to be constant and consistent. So if you're going to be a good friend, you need to be true and genuine. That means you're honest. Number two, you're constant and consistent. Listen to Proverbs 27 verse 10. Do not forsake your own friend or your father's friend, nor go to your brother's house in the day of calamity. Better is a neighbor, or it would be better to say this, better is a friend who's nearby than a brother who is far away. Now, it's not saying that your brother can't be your good friend. It's not making a parallel. It's saying in genuine or in, in general, generality, what happens is this. When you have friends that are true friends, they're constant and they're consistent, you can rely on them. And that won't always be your brother or your family member because they might not live where you live or in the proximity of where you live. So friendship must be based on a mutual agreement and a mutual benefit of giving and receiving. You see, if if you want to be a good friend, you've got to be willing to give. But when you find a friend, that friend mustn't only receive what you're giving, they must also be willing to give because friendship is a relationship of agreement. It's a two-way street that you give and you take, you give and you take. And I want you to know, Mandy and I don't measure that. You know, I don't have a little black book and I measure, okay, I gave this this week. All right, so today, okay, I've got the whole afternoon off. I'll be playing golf, watching TV, and uh, that's it because, Mandy, you've done nothing for me this week. 
Now, I'm not speaking prophetically, okay? I'm just using an example. And Mandy doesn't have a book where she keeps track of, you know, you gave this. Now, okay, I'm just going to be honest and, and just let out some of the, you know, some of the stuff out of the bag, cat out of the bag stuff this morning. Occasionally, I do sometimes have a sway to my old nature. And, you know, I, I have a little bit of a, a thing where I say, like, you know, I've made you 42 cups of tea in a row. And there's been no reciprocation. How many of you know? Every now and then we have a moment of weakness. And I'm like, seriously? Like Friday night after Valentine's dinner, we got home and Manny's like, yo, I'll make the tea. 35 minutes later, it's like, you're in bed. Do you get to make tea when? And I'm exaggerating, eh? <laughs> oh, well, I'm up here with the mic. You're down there. It's all good. No, I'm saying it's got to be a give and take, and there's got to be a thing where you have a generous spirit and a heart to want that relationship to work. That's what I'm talking about. All right, what do I mean by constant and consistent? The word constant, if you look in the dictionary, and this will explain it, the word constant means to have a fixed value, to have an element of faithfulness and loyalty, and to have unchanging nature. In other words, there's a, there's a constancy about your relationship. You're not up one day, down the next day, up for half a day, down for half a day, moody, throwing your toys out the cot, then the next minute you're the best friend, then you're angry, chucking things, and then you're this way and that way. Then the reality is this, is there's no constancy to your own relationship. So how are you gonna build another one? Consistency, the word in the dictionary means this, to be fair or accurate, always acting or behaving in the same or similar way. You see, so friendship, there needs to be a, a wholeness about our lives if we want to build good friendships. Number three, characteristics of friendship. Number three, the third one, uh, friendship needs to, one of, one of the powerful characteristics of friendship is it's edifying and it's unconditional. And I love this about friendship. True friendship is so beautiful. Proverbs 27 verse six, uh, you love this verse. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. But the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Now, let me talk to you about edifying and unconditional. The word edifying means to build up, and the word unconditional means to be without restraint or without counting the cost. In other words, you can write this down. It takes effort to build and develop good friendship. And it always takes a giving and a taking. There's gotta be forgiveness. There's gotta be love. And I want you to know friendship should build you up, but friendship should also stretch you out. <laughs> Amen? You see, we want the building up. We want what we can get out of it, but we don't always want the stretching out. Uh, I want to know, Mandy and I have a great friendship, and, and we've been building that friendship now for seven years. This year we go for eight years, and I want you to know uh, Mandy is excellent at building, but she's also very good at stretching. No, I'm serious. This, I'm complimenting her now. Really, she, she stretches me on so many levels in a good way. Yeah, and what happens is because the, the wounds of a friend are faithful, it helps me to align my life and, and, and cause my life to continue to grow and to stretch and to be something positive. You see, let me ask you this. Write these two questions down. Can you say what you need to say to people in love? Listen carefully. Or are you always having to walk on eggs around them? Oh, I don't want to say this because then they're going to do this. Oh, today's not the right time. I can just see they're in a mood. Listen, if that's the friendship you have, you need to stand back and have a look at and evaluate what's really going on. And maybe you or them or both of you need to get help. Because listen, you've got to come. If you're going to have real friendship, you've got to come to a place in your relationship with people where you can say what you need to say. Bump the person next to you and say, amen. Oh, did you enjoy that? Here's the second question. Can you receive? Can you receive what others need to say to you? <laughs> amen. The two questions need to go together. Can you say what you need to say to your friends? Number two, can you receive what you need to receive from them? You see, I, I, and I'm just using myself and Mandy as an example because then I don't step on anybody's toes, but I've got a lot of other friends that, that can do this. But I want you to know, Mandy and I, 
want to have a relationship. And this week she had to say something to me that was a wound. It wasn't easy for her to say, but she needed to say it. And, it. and it corrected me and I realized, you know what, I need to address that because it's affecting our relationship. So can you say what you need to say, number one, but number two, can you receive what you need to hear in your life? Because friendship is about edifying and it's about being unconditional. 1 Corinthians 13, 13 says, and you can go read it. Go read 1 Corinthians 13. It's a chapter of love. And according to the New Testament, it tells us and teaches us that Christians have an advantage over everybody else. You know why? Because the love of God has been shed abroad in your heart. You don't just have a natural love. You have a supernatural love that's been placed there by God, by the Holy Spirit. And so you can add God's divine love to your natural love, and that becomes supernatural love. So you can love people more beyond with an unconditional love because Christ and his love has been shed abroad in your heart. Can you say amen? That's why marriages and relationships in the church should be much better than they ever could be in the world. Can you say amen? Are you getting some help? My time is up. I'm gonna just take five minutes and give you the benefits of friendship just quickly. Is that okay with you? Here are the benefits. Number one, Friendship is stimulating. Proverbs 27, 17 says this, as iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. The word stimulating means to make more active. It means to cause to encourage, to cause to develop or cause something to happen. The word stimulate means to make a person excited or interested or to keep their attention. You see, this, this word here in Proverbs, uh, that, that iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens his countenance of a friend. It intimates the privilege and the pleasure of interaction between each other. And that interaction mustn't just be a mundane interaction. It should produce something. It should, it should stimulate encouragement. It should lead to greater effectiveness. It should cause your life to be sharper and more keen and more cutting edge. Those are the friends you want in your life. Can you say amen? They make you better. They make you sharper. They make you want to live life and, and, and make a difference in this world. Number two, the benefit of friend, friendship. So number one, when you've got good friends, they'll stimulate you. Number two, Friendship is profitable. Ecclesiastes 4 verse 9 and 10 says, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. The word profitable means to be beneficial, worthwhile, successful, helpful, and supportive. When, when we have the right friends and when we are good friends to others, what we'll do is we'll be profitable to that relationship. We'll be worthwhile and we'll help and we'll make a difference. Can you say amen? Number three, the last one this morning, benefits of friendship. Number three, the third benefit of friendship this morning is it's always fulfilling. Friendship brings a level of fulfillment into your life. Romans 1 verse 12, the Apostle Paul says this, that is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith both of you and of me. Isn't that a beautiful scripture? Paul was saying, because of this friendship that we have, because of this partnership we have, not only are you encouraged, but I'm also encouraged by our like faith that we have in the kingdom of God. And I want you to know there's something supernatural that happens when we have fellowship and we interact and we have friendship. The word fulfilling means to make satisfied or happy through allowing our character and our abilities to develop and to rub off on each other. Isn't that beautiful? So here's what fulfilling means. It produces a sense of belonging and meaning in my life that makes me feel worthwhile. It adds value. Number two, it creates an opportunity for expansion and growth in my life. And number three, it propels me towards my destiny and my purpose. When, when I see my life makes a difference to other people, it gives me an element of purpose and destiny in my life that makes a difference. It brings hope into me. Can you say amen? So uh, I want to close with the scripture and, the, and then the stewards can uh, start to get ready because we're going to have communion this morning. John 15, verse 16 and 17. As a matter of fact, the stewards, you can start serving up the communion at this time. We decided to do communion at the end because of the nature of our teaching this morning. And I thought it would really 
wonderful and powerful that as we partake of that communion this morning, let's do this. Number one, let's receive the love of Jesus into our lives. Let's remember this morning that Jesus called you his friend and that you have access to the Father this morning because of his rich and his great and his wonderful love this morning. And uh, Peter's just gonna put on some music. The worship team can come up just now. Uh, You can just enjoy communion down there this morning. And uh, I want you to know that in John 15, 16, it says, you did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you that you should go forth and bear fruit and that that fruit should remain. That whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. These things I command you that you love one another. I want to remind you today, we have chosen to be, and we have been chosen to be the friends of God. But we haven't been left alone to go out into this world and to preach the gospel. God made a covenant with us through his son, Jesus Christ. It has been sealed with the guarantee of the Holy Spirit. And every time we come together and we partake of the communion elements, We're remembering that covenant that God has made with us. It's a covenant of grace and it's a covenant of peace. And it empowers us not just to love Jesus, but to serve others and to love God wholeheartedly.